Once upon a time, this factory was a buzzing hive of industry, creating products that were shipped across the country and across the world. But today, it sits empty and abandoned. Hi, Walther's George Roberts Printing is the kit we're building today as the start of an abandoned factory complex, part of my entry into the Walther's National Model Railroad Build-Off 2022. This factory building is empty and abandoned, so there isn't a lot of interior detail. With the compression inherent in model railroading, putting interiors in buildings can be tricky. I decided to just have a freight elevator, an entryway and reception office, and some restrooms to avoid issues. Using cast iron antique staircases as inspiration, I built some of those to connect the floors. The fourth floor houses mechanical equipment, including boilers, chillers, and the elevator lift. I decided to add ceiling details. There are support trusses and light fixtures. The light fixtures are designed to hold a 1 by one millimeter surface mount LED, with the wires going up through the fixture. And as the last detail, I made a rooftop HVAC unit. Now let's put it together. Everything was primed, then I started by painting the exterior walls. They were sponged with various hues of red, brown, and orange to match my inspiration photos. I had tried painting individual bricks, but they looked like individual bricks painted with cheap craft paint rather than bricks of different colors. I then mixed up a light gray oil wash to highlight the mortar joints and give variation from wall to wall and within each wall. Then clean thinner was used to clean up any errant wash. I've seen many people try to fill the mortar joints with joint compound or other material. I think this is a needless complication as the joint compound is a complete mess and stark white, whereas mortar should be a shade of gray. If one is painting the bricks a single color, priming with the desired mortar color, then sponging the bricks with a flat, smooth sponge is a very simple and quick way to get clean mortar lines. Next, the brick was masked off and the concrete got painted with chalk paint. I started with a lighter color this time as the black and rust streaks would tone things down considerably. After two coats of concrete paint, everything was unmasked. Here are all the panels painted and unmasked. Now the interior walls were sponged with the light green color chosen for the interior details to suggest old and peeling paint on concrete. The exterior walls were weathered. Oil paint dots were applied, then blended up and down the concrete to replicate the dark stains in my reference photos. After that dried, I went back with ammo rust oil brushes and added rust stains. I'm glad I started with a lighter color for the concrete, as the shade came out just about right after the weathering, and would have been too dark if I used the darker color I normally do. Next, the interior details I designed and printed were painted. I started with the walls, which got a coat of light green to suggest the greater age of this building. A modern factory would typically have walls in a light grayish color for better visibility. Then, everything else got colors that made sense. White for the fixtures, blue for the doors, high visibility yellow for the door frames. Next was a black wash. This is just black craft paint and water, but this time I added some polysorbate 20, which is a surfactant and seemed to help wetting out. You could use dish soap also, but the polysorbate doesn't foam up when you shake the bottle to mix it. I printed out some signs and details to add to the details. Compound details are always the best. Control panels and warning signs on the HVAC equipment, men's room signs, employees must wash their hands and safety glasses warnings. In the reception office, I put up a poster that I borrowed from Thunder Mesa Studios, along with the Walters catalog and some model railroad magazines on the desk. I put several Thunder Mesa posters up throughout the factory. Dave has some cool artwork you can check out at thundermesa.studio. The lights and staircases were painted next. I decided to prime the staircases black, then sponge on the dark green trim color over the top, thinking it would look like cast iron with peeling paint. I forgot that the craft paint does not cover like the enamel I was envisioning on the cast iron, so it just looked black. I wound up painting over the whole thing in green, then dry brushing with yellow green to bring out the highlights. The elevator drive mechanism was rigged with cables next. A little chipping with some silver came after that on all the pieces. The HVAC roof unit was streaked with rust and given a little rust wash for good measure. Putting the LEDs into the lights was up next. The two wires were a bit wider than the LED itself, so the wire channels were cleaned out with a number 72 drill. The resistor was cut off each light, the wires threaded through the trough, and it was super glued into place. Then each one was checked to make sure nothing got damaged during the installation. Once all the lights were assembled, they were glued in pairs to a truss. I used cool white LEDs for the main building to reflect typical high bay factory lights, 
and warm from the mechanical room to portray incandescent bulbs. As you can see here, a note on wiring LEDs with resistors to limit the current. When doing this, you subtract the sum of the forward voltages of the LEDs wired in series from the supply voltage, then divide that by the current you want in the circuit to get the resistance you need. Typically, LEDs are strung together until the forward voltage is just below the supply voltage, then those strings are wired in parallel, which is what I did. But one of the lights didn't work. I think I shorted the wires gluing it in. But since the other LED on that truss did, I used it. One dead light in an abandoned factory isn't unexpected. But when I wired it with the other strings, only the one-eyed string would light. I chased this for a while until I realized that a string with fewer LEDs needs more resistance to balance the voltage drop in current. In short, the string had three volts less forward voltage, would turn on first, and prevent all the other strings from turning on at all. I'm glad I figured this out, because even though I replaced the dead LED on that truss, I needed the extra resistor for the single fixture in the mechanical room. The windows and doors were painted with a dark green as step one. Then various rust colors were sponged over, starting with the light rust on the outer and upper edges, progressing to a dark color in the center and bottom. The frames were installed in the walls. The panes were glued on with tacky glue. In hindsight, I would have made my own from acetate. The injection molded windows in the kit are not very clear, have knit lines from the molding which look like scratches, and are very thick, which caused me heartburn when installing the floors. Of course, the kit wasn't designed with an interior in mind, but if I had it to do over, those windows would be gone. The floors were laid out on a styrene for sale sign from Home Depot, then cut out. Not sure if this was the least expensive option, but it was convenient. The walls were assembled starting with the front entry. Some of the walls not critical to holding the building together were left out to aid in installation of the floors, starting with the first. Going back to the model railroad compression point, the first floor has a bit of a conundrum. The front entry is at ground level, but all the rest of the docks and doors are about four scale feet higher, so somewhere it has to go up or down. I've never met an industrial engineer or plant manager who wanted ramps and stairs on the factory floor, so I put stairs up right at the front entry, and the remainder of the first floor is flat. Next, all the floors were mocked up to confirm floor heights. It turned out, despite careful measuring, the stack was too tall. The solution was to decrease the height of the first floor, which involved cutting down the first floor freight elevator. Two wires were run up the end walls to power the lights. Then spacers were cut, painted, and installed to hold up the second floor. The lights were glued to the floor with contact cement because it remains pretty flexible and it seemed there might be a lot of flexing required to get the floors in place. And the only thing worse than having stuff pop off during installation is having it pop off after everything is assembled and you can't get to it. The second floor was glued in after the first floor details were attached. Then the leads from the LEDs were soldered to the feeder lines. The third floor followed the same pattern. Lights glued to the third floor, details to the second, then glue the floor in. Now was a good time to install the two remaining walls that go all the way to the ground. The third floor lights were installed. These were a bit tricky because one row crosses the roof and the fabricated fourth floor. It worked out okay to glue it to the fourth floor, then wedge it under the installed roof. The final wall is installed after the fourth floor is glued in. The fourth floor details were installed. Boilers, chillers, and the elevator motor. Next, the exterior details were assembled. The water tower and base, the chimney, the vent stacks, the staircase, and fire escape components. Even though the instructions said to assemble the fire escape first, then install it onto the building, that didn't work very well. So I took it all apart and assembled the parts onto the buildings. There were also issues with the actual part. The stair railings blocked the escape doors and the swing down stairs interfered with the brace. Looking at the box picture, the railings were not installed and the drop down stairs were different. I removed the inner railings from the stairs and trim the interfering brace to allow the drop down stairs to fit. A little frustrating. Covering the roof was next. After experimenting with grout, ballast, and various grits of sandpaper, I settled on 120 grit with a sealed backing. I sprayed it lightly with gray primer to get the base color I wanted and cut up the needed shapes. Hint, cut from the back side. Much easier on the blade. The molded features for locating the roof details were removed with a fresh razor blade as they interfere with the sandpaper. The material was glued down with tacky glue and weighted to make sure the corners did not curl up. I needed something to fill the edge gaps, so I mixed up roofing sealer with some lacquer thinner and painted it on. Technically the gravel and tar would go right up to the edge, but I'm invoking modeler's license to fill the gap. The roof details were installed. I took a picture before I shaved off the locating features, but there was some guesswork involved. Next, 
the bright gray was toned down with a wash, then weathered with some pastels and unsanded grout. The last step was to affix a for sale or lease sign I drew up in Photoshop. The info was pure fiction, although some folks may find the phone number familiar and the QR code works. Now it's time for the final reveal and glamour shots. That's it for this episode. So remember, give it a like if you liked what you saw. If you want to see more, subscribe. And let me know what you thought down in the comments. Thanks for watching.